or coalition. Thanks very much, Kate, and thanks to everybody for coming. I wanted to very much follow on from what Tom said, but I think it is first worth saying that we've got an awful lot of catching up to do about the nature of nuclear power and the nature of nuclear weapons, which many of us from my generation, we learned from what CND did in the 50s and 60s, and we learned it again around Greenham Common and around the big campaigns to remove cruise missiles from British bases. But what it seems to me today is happening is that our government and other governments are treating nuclear power as somehow green and therefore completely safe to use, which is a very, very dangerous uh, approach to take. But they're also taking the approach that nuclear weapons aren't any kind of big deal, that we uh, will be using them as tactical nuclear weapons, as they're often called, in various conflicts, <coughs> without at all spelling out what nuclear war and what nuclear weapons really mean. And I just want to start by saying a little bit about that, because I don't think lots of people know, but one nuclear weapon dropped on London would destroy the whole of central London. That would be the effect of it. If you look at, if there was a war between the US and Russia, which was a nuclear war, then you're talking about hundreds of millions of people dying. And that's, if you think the Second World War, the total casualties in the Second World War was something like 60 million people, it's almost incredible to believe how much worse it could be, even with a relatively what they call limited nuclear war. And of course, because we're talking about climate change here today, if you look at all war, it has a terrible effect on the climate and on the environment. We know this. We know this from every war, from the depleted uranium which is now being used, from all these different kind of things. But if you look at nuclear war, you're talking about the possibility of starvation of up to 2 billion people on the planet as a result of the destruction of nuclear war. You're talking about a nuclear winter which would destroy the whole ecosystem as we understand it. And therefore you're talking about the destruction of the planet accelerated. We know it's already going on and that's why we're here today, but accelerated in the most terrible way. And that is something, again, when we look at the crisis of our NHS, when we look at the fact that the doctors and nurses are having to go out and strike to get any kind of decent pay rise, that we know we're having to wait to see GPs, we're having to queue for hours in accident and emergency, how do you think our underfunded public services in this country and all sorts of other countries would deal with this kind of threat of the catastrophe that we're talking about? What do we think when we talk about the refugees who are coming from all over the conflict zones of the world? And I personally welcome the refugees coming here. I think we have a duty to look after and care for the refugees who are displaced because of war or for any other reason. But how do you think... How do you think this society would cope with the millions of people who would be made refugees as a result of a nuclear war? And I think this message we have to get across as widely as possible. I know this is what CND does and we work very closely with CND, but we need to get this to a wider audience. And linking it up with this question of climate change, I think, is an absolutely vital way of, of doing so. The second thing I want to say is related to the questions that Tom raised about Ukraine. We've had a war in Ukraine going on for more than a year. It has caused massive death and destruction already. Tens of thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands of people, have already died on both sides of the conflict. I've always taken the view that the Russian invasion was wrong, and we always condemned the Russian invasion. But I have to say, there is no military solution to this war, particularly because it isn't just between Ukraine and Russia. It's between NATO as a proxy war with Russia. And therefore, you're talking about two nuclear powers fighting one another. The idea that you're going to get a military settlement out of this is completely wrong. What you're going to get, if one side advances, then the possibility of a nuclear threat will become more and more real. Already we've had Putin talking about he will use 
ta tactical nuclear weapons. And we have to believe that that is a possibility. And it's a possibility that the people of Ukraine shouldn't have to countenance, the people of Russia shouldn't have to countenance, and nor should any of us here in Europe have to countenance that possibility. That is why we talk about the only solution to this crisis is a ceasefire and peace talks now. Because otherwise we would be drawn into bigger and bigger wars. We know at Lake and Heath in Suffolk they're already upgrading the levels of nuclear weapons which are now stationed at that base. That's also happening in Germany. By the way, it's not just happening in Europe. If you look at what is going on in the Pacific, because there's also growing threat of conflict with China, what are we seeing there? We're seeing more and more American bases. We're seeing the AUKUS Pact, which is giving Australia nuclear-powered submarines, even though it's not a nuclear state. We're seeing that Japan, one of the biggest military powers historically in the region, is doubling its arms spending in response to the growing tensions in the world. Now, all of this will involve what's called conventional warfare, and we know from Afghanistan and Iraq and everywhere else, we know how bad conventional warfare is itself in the 21st century, but it will also involve the possible threat of nuclear war as well. And therefore, we have to oppose what is going on and what our government is doing. And it seems to me that if you look at the U UK government, the British government here, we've had successive prime ministers who have committed to more and more arms spending, who have committed to more and more weapons, who are the keenest to send weapons to Ukraine. British, uh, British tanks have been going there. The former Prime Ministers Boris Johnson and Liz Trust both called in Parliament earlier this year for fighter jets to be sent to Ukraine, although that will almost certainly escalate the war in a very, very dangerous uh, direction. We now find out, last week from the leaks from America, that there are 50 special forces, UK special forces, in Ukraine itself doing the fighting, presumably. We also saw from those leaks that there was a very near miss between a Russian plane and an RAF tornado over Ukraine, over the Black Sea. These are terrifying prospects of escalation of war, and we have to be opposed to them. So it is very important that we do. We also have a government... Boris Johnson made it clear two years ago that the, US, the UK government will use nukes against non-nuclear states. So all this talk about these are only defensive is absolute rubbish. This government and the United States government and indeed the Russian government, all sorts of others, will be perfectly, will be perfectly keen on using these weapons if they think it gives them a military advantage. Therefore, two things I think today. Disarmament now, no nuclear weapons, and let's stop the spending on the military, which is going instead of spending on the nurses, instead of spending on our education, instead of spending on the housing where we have the biggest crisis that we've seen since the Second World War. So that should be one of our priorities. The second priority is that we have to keep linking this question of war with the question of climate change. We cannot save the planet without saving a world which is committed to disarmament and peace rather than to war. That's what we're fighting for. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, Lindsay. Brilliant. Very strong messaging there.